Now let us look at some theories which are able to explain world trade, not explained by the HOS model. And I call them modern theories of international trade simply because all of them were developed after the HOS model was developed. The first theory we examine is will explain foreign trade based on dynamic technological differences. We know in this world there are some countries which are technologically advanced and some which are not. And when we say a country is technologically advanced, what, they mean, what we mean is they have high level of skilled workers and also the amount of money they spend on research and development is much higher. So they have the resources to be the first ones to develop, produce, and sell a new product. So technologically advanced countries have a relative abundance of highly skilled workers, and the amount of money they spend on R&D is also high. And so these countries become the first ones to develop, produce, and sell a new product. The first model which explained this phenomena is called the technological gap model. And this is due to Posner, 1961. This technological gap model was extended and generalized by Vernon in 1966. And this is called the product life cycle model. So let us just examine product life cycle model now. According to this model, the product life cycle model, a product goes through five stages. And let us now look at these five stages. Stage one, and this is also called the new product stage. And at this stage, the product is introduced, produced, and consumed in the innovating or the technologically advanced country. So this is stage one. Stage two is called the product growth stage. In this stage, what happens is production is perfected in the innovating or technologically advanced country. And this amount, this production increases very rapidly to meet domestic and foreign demand. So stages one and two, stage one, initially the product is introduced in the technologically advanced country and two, the production is perfected in an innovating country and production rises rapidly to meet domestic and foreign demand. In the third stage of a product, which is called the product maturity stage, in this stage, the production becomes standardized. So it's very easy for other firms, once they have the technology, it's very easy for them to replicate the process or produce the product on their own. And thus, at this stage, maybe the innovating country may find it profitable to invest in other countries and start production units in other countries to take advantage of cheap skilled labor. And here you can think of a number of examples like Japan earlier, South Korea, China, and so on. In these countries, a lot of foreign investment was possible simply because these companies wanted to make use of cheap, skilled workers there. This kind of foreign investment is referred to as efficiency seeking foreign direct investment or efficiency seeking FDI. Another way the firms find it profitable is to license this technology to other domestic and foreign firms to manufacture this product. So this could happen as well. Another possibility in the third stage is, though the original company in the innovating country may not permit this, but then manufacturers in other countries through imitation can start to produce this product. And this is also possible. In stage four, other countries which are now producing this product, we can call them the imitating country, facing lower production costs, start to undersell 
the innovating country in third markets. And all this is happening because of cheap labor cost in other countries. And so at this stage, what happens is production in an innovating country starts to decline because they can meet less and less of foreign demand because of the market condition. The last stage in the life of a product is the fifth stage. And this is called the product decline stage. And at this stage, what happens is the imitating country starts to undersell in innovating country. And so the production in innovating country rapidly declines or collapses. And so these are the five stages in product life cycle model. You'll find numerous examples of this kind of phenomena taking place. That is, initially the production takes place in the innovating or the technologically advanced country, and then it slowly moves to other countries, which we have called imitating countries. Now, just let us look at one example, and this is about radios. Now, immediately after World War II, the U.S. firms dominated the world market for radios based on vacuum tubes technology. And within a few years, Japan was able to capture a large part of the market by copying U.S. technology and using cheap labor. Then subsequently, the U.S. recaptured the market with the development of what are called transistors. Over time, once again, Japan imitated the technology and was able to undersell U.S. producers in the U.S. Again, the U.S. reacquired its leadership status in this market by introducing printed circuits. And once again, the story goes on. Now all this is being produced elsewhere. So what we know is by turning out new products and technologies, U.S. is ranked as the most competitive nation in the world. And I, this is an example of radios. You can find it in case of shaving razors, television sets, and so on. Thus, product life cycle model is able to explain pattern of foreign trade over time or in a dynamic sense. And what we know and understand is initially technologically advanced country will export new items and other countries will import these new items. Over time, as production uh, process is transferred to other countries, technologically advanced country will become an importer of the same product it was exporting and other countries will start exporting the products that they were importing. Thus, it is safe to say that in a dynamic sense, comparative advantage shifts across countries from technologically advanced countries to other countries. A lot of foreign trade can be explained by, by, the, by the behavior of companies as to where they locate their production facilities. For example, in some country, they find natural resources, for example, copper in Zambia, crude oil in the Middle East, and so on. And here, a lot of foreign investment may take place near the source of raw materials. And this foreign investment will be there simply because in certain cases, goods become lighter with certain amount of production processing. And so you can look at crude oil, you can look at minerals and ores and so on. And this kind of foreign investment is called resource seeking foreign direct investment. And so once this natural resource has been worked upon, taken out from the mother earth, these countries will now sell it to other countries or will start exporting to other countries. So this could be one reason for foreign investment that they want to be closer to wherever we have natural resources. Another place we have found we have foreign investments and that is in the market oriented industry. 
And this kind of foreign investment is called market seeking foreign direct investment or market seeking FDI. Sometimes it makes sense for big companies to locate the production facilities wherever they want to sell their product. For example, Ford may decide to open up a plant in India simply to sell cars in India itself. So marking seeking foreign investment. And this is the second type of foreign investment. The third is what we call the footloose industry. They have neither substantial weight loss or gain during production process. And these industries tend to have high value to weight ratio and are highly mobile of footloose. And what these countries make base their decision on is what kind of tax incentives they are getting in different countries and they would go to a country which gives the maximum tax benefit. So this completes our discussion of two models, one explaining foreign trade based on technological gap and the second one location of the industry that also determines the pattern of foreign trade. Thank you for your time.